It had been Paul's lifelong ambition to go to Rome. As a Roman citizen, he'd always wanted to visit the, the city. Rome was the capital of the then Roman Empire. Its founding had been called the grandest political achievement ever accomplished. It was the guardian of the Greek language, culture, and thought. It was the legal, administrative, communication, and travel, travel hub of the entire world. Facilitated and secured by an extensive system of roads and ports guarded by the most powerful army and navy to ever inhabit the earth. Its building and architectures were renowned. The three circuses, along with the famous chariot races, the palaces of the Caesars, the tombs, the temples, the pantheon, the theaters, the baths, the aqueducts, and of course, the forum at the center of it all. But it wasn't mere tourism that attracted Paul. Ever since that fateful day on the Damascus Road when he had met the risen Lord and had been confronted by him, saved by him, and commissioned by him to be his chosen instrument to proclaim the, to proclaim the gospel to the Gentiles, it had been his single ambition to preach the gospel in the center of the city of Rome. The gospel had to be preached there so that it could radiate out from there. There is a reason that his manifesto of the gospel, what we know as the, the letter to the Romans, was addressed there. It was the gospel for the whole world. Even though it was written some 25 years on into his ministry. Don't, don't forget that. But Paul had been about from the day of Damascus till the time that he sent his letter to the Romans. 25 years had elapsed. In his introduction to that letter, he writes, I don't want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I had planned many times to come to you in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have had among the other Gentiles. But I have been prevented from doing so until now. He had never gotten the green light. As much as he was burdened to go there, as much as he longed to go there, as much as he sensed the strategic importance of going there, it had never come in all of those years until now. Why? That's one of the big questions, isn't it? You would think that it would have been one of the first places for him to go, but God knew better. And Paul submitted to that. But the desire and the ambition and the importance, the strategic sense of importance of going there had in no way waned or lessened in those 25 years. And so at the end of that letter, he writes, I have been longing for many years to visit you. Now, at last, I plan to do so. I know that when I come, I will come to you now in the full measure of Christ's blessing. Twenty-five years later, he still knew the strategic importance of Rome to the worldwide spread and impact of the gospel. He knew that. He writes in the introduction to Romans, your faith, the faith of that Roman church, he says, is being reported all over the world. That is what happened there impacted everywhere. And even though there was already a church there, which had likely been there since the day of Pentecost, because Luke tells us that on that day there were visitors from Rome who came, who went back and planted that church there, Paul knew that he still had a harvest to reap there. He had an impact to make on the further evangelization of that city that would impact far beyond Rome. Even at this point, let me make this point, even at this late, late stage of his life. Which makes his journey and his arrival there all the more significant. It is first worth noting that everything that Luke records in chapter 27 and 28 
of Acts hinges on four words, just four words, which Paul spoke at his trial before Festus, the Roman governor, when he said this, I appeal to Caesar. Festus, in order to curry the favor of the Jews, had wanted to make Paul stand trial back in Jerusalem. Paul, fearing that he would not receive a fair trial there, had appealed to Caesar. When King Agrippa, however, had made a sudden unexpected visit to Festus, the new replacement governor, Paul ended up appearing in trial before him, Agrippa, at the end of which Agrippa declared this, this man has done nothing to deserve death or imprisonment. Paul knew that. None of the other trials had been able to prove that. And then he added these words. This man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. If Paul had not made his appeal on that previous occasion, he could have been released. He could have gone to Rome a free man in his own time, on his own terms, in his own way. Instead, he would go there as a Roman prisoner. How different things might have been. But as C.S. Lewis wisely reminds us, there are no what-ifs for the child of God. There are no what-ifs. God is sovereignly ordering his plans and purposes for his perfect will. I don't know about you, but I can look back on a number of occasions in my life where major changes took place on one, one brief word or brief understanding, and you rack your brain and looking back and saying, should I have done that? Should I have said that? Lewis rightly said, we can't do that. He is sovereign over those moments. It's very easy in hindsight to look back and say, oh, I should have thought about it this way or that way. But I can't go back. And the reality is that in that time I was making a decision, a prayerful decision, seeking his way. And even the mistakes that we can look back with certainty and say, I should not have done that. He was overruling for his sovereign plans and purposes. It was decided that Paul, along with other prisoners, would sail for Italy. They were entrusted to a centurion by the name of Julius, a member of the Imperial Regiment. That's Caesar's own. <laughs> he emerges in the account as a kind and sensible man, giving Paul preferential treatment, probably owing to his status as a Roman citizen, but I think also because there was something about Paul that Julius admired. He allowed Paul's companions, Luke and Aristarchus, to travel with him, and he allowed Paul's friends to supply his needs for the journey. What followed is a truly epic account of survival at sea. They first boarded a local ship in Caesarea and made their way up the coast of Asia in search of a ship sailing for Italy. From Sidon, they had to cross the open sea but because the prevailing winds were against them, they had, to travel to, they had to travel up the sheltered side of the island of Cyprus, eventually making their way to the port of Myra in Lycia. There Julius found an Egyptian grain ship sailing from Alexandria to Rome, and he secured passage for his soldiers and prisoners. Luke tells us that for many days it was painfully slow going. And finally, when the winds would not allow them to hold their course, they had to make their way along the sheltered side of the island of Crete, arriving at a place on the coast known as Fair Havens. It was now very late in the year in terms of the approaching winter, and they had lost much time. Paul, who may well have been the most experienced traveler on the ship, warned them in no uncertain terms that they should go no further these were his words in verse 10. Men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and to bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives also. 
But because both the pilot and the owner of the ship advised that they go on, since this was not a suitable place to winter, and they wanted to reach the port of Phoenix, the centurion went along with the majority opinion and their advice. No sooner had they set sail than a monstrous northeaster swept down upon them with hurricane force winds. They were blown out of the shelter of the island into the open sea where they began a battle, an epic battle for their survival. First, they were barely able to secure the lifeboat by hauling it into the ship. Luke writes, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. It's one of those uh, we uh, references in Luke in which he indicates that he and Paul and the others were all part of that. It took every hand on deck to try to secure that lifeboat and get it onto the ship. Secondly, they frapped the ship. That's the term that's used, running huge ropes under the hull to lash the stern and the bow together to keep the timbers from tearing apart and breaking apart in the midst of the storm. And third, to avoid the dreaded sandbars of Sirtis, they lowered their anchors to serve as brakes as they tried to drag along slowly. The ship was being battered by sea so hard that the next day they threw over the entire cargo. And the following day, in a desperate move, the ship's tackle itself. After 14 days of continuous raging storm without sun and stars and without a compass, they finally gave up all hope of being saved. And as is so often the case, it was not until that point at which all the hope of being saved was gone, that they were finally ready to listen. And God spoke through his servant, Paul. Verse 21. After they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourself this damage and loss. That was not a nasty I told you so. That was just underscoring the point that he had been very accurate before and they ought to have confidence in the accuracy of what he was going to tell them now. But now I urge you to keep your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I have stood beside me and the, I'm sorry, last night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar, and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. That night, still being driven by the storm, the sailors sensed they were approaching land. Perhaps they could hear the thunder of the waves crashing against the land. They began to take several soundings, and each sounding was more shallow, and they were keenly aware that they were approaching land. Fearing that they would crash against the rocks, they dropped their anchors and they prayed for daylight. They were praying now, Luke tells us. The soldiers pretended that they were working the anchors when they were actually lowering the lifeboat in order to try to escape the ship. But Paul warned the centurion that unless they stayed with the ship, they would not be saved. This time they listened, and they cut the the lifeboat loose. Before dawn, Paul urged everyone on board to eat. In the tumult and suspense of that perpetual ongoing storm, they hadn't eaten for almost two weeks. They allowed Paul to give grace. He took bread and standing before them, gave thanks, held it up and gave thanks and broke it before them all and they all partook. It was not believer's communion, but it was close. It was close. After they had eaten all that they wanted, they threw the remaining provisions into the sea. When the morning dawned, they could see land. And they could see a bay with a sandy beach. So they quickly hoisted their sails and readied their rudders and made for a run for shore, direct run. 
But the ship ran aground against a sandbar and immediately began to be to break up against the pounding surf. The soldiers were going to kill the prisoners rather than have any of them escape. That was Roman standard operating procedure because you got it you didn't get in trouble for killing a prisoner but if a prisoner escaped it was your life so they were going to do what any roman soldier would have done but because the centurion wanted to spare paul's life he ordered them not to those who could swim did those who could not rode a plank from the ship and they made their way to the shore The islanders were friendly. They showed them unusual kindness, building bonfires in the midst of a cold and ongoing rain to try to warm them, to try to help them warm. And so they survived. That would be the definition in my book of narrow escape. That would be the definition of saved by the skin of your teeth. 14 days of raging storm, everything in your power to try to empty the boat of everything that was there and hold it together. Finally land, you run, the ship strikes sand, begins to break apart, but you're just close enough to be able to swim or ride into the shore. And everyone makes it. All 276 souls. Nothing but the hair on their heads, but not a single hair lost, in the words of Paul. Now, it's a fascinating story. The question is, why did Luke devote so much editorial space and detail to that account? What was his intent and his purpose beyond just being a great story? It was twofold. It showed the degree, it showed and underscored the degree a spiritual opposition at work against Paul's coming to Rome. The closer that Paul got to Rome, the more the spiritual opposition intensified. When Paul wrote his letter to the Romans, he clearly intended to complete his task in Jerusalem and come straight to Rome. That's what he wrote them. But he already began to have an awareness of the possibility of a pending opposition because at the end of the letter he asked the Romans to please join me in my struggle by praying to God for me that he might keep me safe from unbelievers in Judea and that everything would go favorably. But by the time he actually begins his journey, the Holy Spirit had now warned him. Remember, we considered those words as we began this section that continual prison and hardship was facing him. It wasn't going to come easy. The more significant the work, the closer it gets to realization, the greater the spiritual opposition. Isn't that interesting? The more significant the work, the closer it gets to realization, the greater the spiritual opposition. That is the consistent testimony of Scripture. The devil's attempts to thwart the purposes of God and his greatest attempts to thwart the greatest purposes. From Pharaoh's attempt to drown the baby Moses to Herod's attempt to destroy the infant Jesus, From Haman's attempts to exterminate the Jews to the Sanhedrin's attempts to stifle the witness of the apostles to every means to keep Jonah from God's mission to Nineveh. The adversary didn't want that. From the riot at Jerusalem to Paul's arrest to the attempt to torture him to the numerous conspiracies to murder him, to his two years of judicial limbo and confinement as politics played out, now to the life-threatening storm 
And no sooner is he delivered through that storm and that amazing account than on the beach the islanders are building bonfires to help them warm. And Paul, typical of Paul, is helping to gather the firewood for the bonfires. That's a leader, isn't it? That's a leader, isn't it, Todd? Out there with them helping to to gather up the firewood and grabs a big pile of brush and as he's hauling it over to throw it into the bonfire there's a viper in the midst of it and the flames cause the buyer, the viper to leap out and grab onto Paul's hand and hang on and Paul shook until finally the viper fell off and the islanders stood by waiting for him to collapse at any moment absolutely convinced that it was the god of Dike they called him the god of justice and revenge that Paul must have done something and the god of Dyke was not going to allow him to, to escape. And then their absolute wonder when after minutes and then hour went by and Paul was fine. And instead of being a, a recipient of the justice of Dyke, they proclaimed him a god, they said. But even to that point, every attempt to waylay his mission to Rome The sea is a biblical symbol of evil powers in opposition to the work of God. It revealed the true value of what Paul had sensed all of his life, of the importance of him coming to help evangelize the city of Rome and what that would mean to the future and ongoing work of the gospel. So that's the first thing. It showed the degree of spiritual opposition at work against Paul's coming to Rome. And here's the second. It showed and revealed and underscored the degree of God's providential work to bring him there. According to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity to the purpose of his will. Ephesians 1.11 There is no wisdom no insight, no plan that can succeed against the Lord. Proverbs 21.30 Most of what I want to say about that I want to reserve for next week. That's the theme of the message. But suffice it to say that God was clearly overruling evil for his good and loving purposes. I want to conclude with three observations and encouragements. They were encouraging to me. I hope they're encouraging to you. Number one, 25 years on into his ministry, now 27, including the two years of confinement, Paul had never lessened or loosened or in any way waned in his ambition to preach the gospel in Rome. It was now important as ever. He submitted to God's providential hand, but he never wavered in his belief, conviction, determination that for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of Christ, the gospel needed to be preached in Rome. I find that noble, Um, admirable. (laughs) And let me say that was not just a matter of a personal bucket list. Like I want to be able to check off that I preached in Rome. It was much, much more than that. It was his belief, conviction, determination for the sake of the gospel and for Christ. Paul had not lessened. Number two, In spite of all of the twists and turns, disappointments, uncertainties, he never lost an opportunity for witness. I love that in the account. Felix, Festus, Agrippa, the soldiers, sailors, and prisoners on grain ship Alexandra, wherever he was. We don't know how many of those came to faith. We're not given that part of the account, but I would imagine a good number. A storm at sea has been the means 
to many a conversion, from John Newton and Amazing Grace, to Bob Munger, who I read from his spiritual autobiography, Leading from the Heart, last week. Bob Munger was a student at Cal Berkeley and did a summer uh, working uh, on ships out in the open sea and ended up in a unbelievable storm that scared the willies out of him and it was the the key ingredient to his conversion. Isn't that a wonderful story? He recounts that in the early part of the, the book. Not to speak of the influence that the Jonah that the ocean had on Jonah in convincing him of, <laughs> of his wrongness, of his intent and plans. Number three, the harder the opposition, the fiercer the storm, the greater the potential for doubt, the nearer the Lord. I love that. The harder the opposition, the fiercer the storm, the greater the potential for doubt, the nearer the Lord. Twice in the midst of those storms, Jesus stood beside Paul. In the midst of the judicial legal storm, the Lord stood near Paul, said to him, take courage, as you've testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify about me in Rome. He needed that encouragement at that moment, and the Lord came and gave it to him. In the midst of the storm at sea, Paul's testimony was last night speaking to the men, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. It's going to happen. Paul needed to hear that at that moment. There was a Sunday here when I was at a particular point of doubt, just significant doubt. In, in trust, trying to trust, but a particular moment of doubt. And a Joe and Jan uh, Miller walk in unannounced, un, you know, un, unprepared. And uh, Jan said that it was just in her prayer that the Lord had put my name on her heart and that's how they had ended up here. And it was at that really given, <laughs> at that given Sunday, at that given moment, that you're walking in and God getting you from there to here was him coming alongside and standing by me like that ship on the middle of that storm to say, I'm here. I'm here. We got a plan for you. For all of you. So be encouraged. Be encouraged by that. I uh, believe with all of my heart that the more that we determine to want to do his will and do his will his way, the harder it will be I was naively not mindful of that when we started. Um, I believe that is the case. And um, that we ought to um, not be surprised by that. And we ought to take that seriously. I think Paul took it seriously. But in the midst of that, to be reminded of his overruling providential hand. Luther used to say that, don't ever forget that Satan is God's Satan. <laughs> he may throw a raging sea. He may do everything in his arsenal to try to keep you from fulfilling his will, but his hand overrules and his hand sees. Would you bow your heads with me? <clears throat> In an attempt to write Paul's life, it's not a chapter that any of us would have imagined, certainly not at this stage or season of his life, Lord. 
the great apostle, having endured so much, having given so much, we would have written something much different for him. We would have presumed that by this, by this point and by this season and given this lifetime desire to go to Rome, that he would be able to go there in some modem or measure of respect and dignity and, and uh, anticipation of a wonderful season of ministry and not, not as a prisoner, not through a, a life-threatening storm. We wouldn't have never written that. But we're reminded by the psalmist that your ways lead often through the deep seas and your footprints are not seen. Meaning that we may not understand all of the many ways. We will some of them as we come to the conclusion. We'll see some of those providential purposes, but we won't see them all. And so may we be faithful in resting our wisdom in your wisdom, our ways in your ways, your purposes. Never waning in our desire and never missing the opportunities that you give us in the meantime along the way. That's what we want to do. We want to do it well. Thank you for Paul's example. Thank you for his encouragement today. We thank you for your table. We thank you for this place of fellowship. We thank you for your nearness. It's an unusual nearness each time we gather at this table, so we, we never want it to be merely routine or habit, but a proper culmination to our time of worship, to draw near to you, to receive from you. Meet each one, strengthen their hearts and souls, encourage them. Fill us all with gratitude and joy for your wonderful gifts in Christ. Bless us, we pray today. We ask all of it in your name.